Hello. Welcome to uh, Radio Free Gastonia, the internet's favorite source of emergency history content. Today we're going to be talking about the revolution of rising expectations, an idea that we've talked about before. Um, and this has to do with our readings um, for this week, Black, Brown, Yellow, Gray, Pink, Power. I asked you guys to look at Malcolm X's The Battle for the Bullet, um, the Brown Berets 10 Point Program, and also the piece by Juan Herrera about um, the Chicano movement in um, California in the 60s and gender. <clears throat> so, you know, this is a very interesting time to be talking about history, I think. Because in the midst of this crisis that we're facing uh, in terms of the coronavirus, a lot of people are sort of seeing the, um, the wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind that curtain. We all know that there are like rules of society and there's an underlying sort of uh, compact, an underlying set of instructions that we all sort of follow. And for the most part, we might think some of the things are unfair, but we think some of the things are fair. If you work hard, you go to work, you pay your bills, you pay your mortgage, um, you don't you know, do bad things, hurt people, kill people, that you should be able to um, live in peace. Like We all kind of take that for granted. But this is a moment where we're really facing a big question about a, a, a concept that we've been talking about all semester which is the idea of the social contract, right? Um, this is the unspoken sort of game plan of society. And, you know, sometimes that's written down. The Constitution, for instance, is like a literal social contract. It says, here are the rules that we agreed on. Here's the rule book, the set of instructions, the instruction manual that we all decided on in the beginning. And now we fought, you know, for several hundred years over what that means and how to change those rules. So we've faced this in the past, right, uh, in this semester and in American history. Remember the case Muller v. Oregon in 1908, which was a question about whether the government could regulate the wages and hours of employees in the marketplace. For a long time, we had this doctrine um, called freedom of contract. We've talked about this before. This is what we call the Lochner era, after the Supreme Court decision in Lochner v. New York, which basically said that the government has no role in intervening between um, people and other people in terms of their agreements to work or exchange money. Uh, I agree to pay you 10 cents an hour. Uh, you agree to dig these ditches. And if you don't want to do it, then you don't take your 10 cents. You go work for another guy making 20 cents digging ditches. Or if, you know, you want more and I don't want to give it to you, then, you know, I find somebody else who will do it. Freedom of contract. That's how things should work. These are just two parties making an agreement. We had that as our sort of dominant legal and political philosophy for a long time in the United States until about the 1930s. Um, of course, we remember in Miller v. Oregon, um, the Supreme Court did say that maybe you could limit the hours of the working hours of women, uh, but it was based on this sort of uh, rather unfortunate sexist um, concept that you know women are more fragile or they're supposed to be mothers, and so that's the reason why the state had a legitimate interest in limiting their hours of work. But that was just a small little sort of step in. The direction that I'm talking about. That was one little kind of carve out of the idea of freedom of contract. Of course, in the 1930s, we saw the Social Security Act, the Wagner Act, these, um, uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, these measures to face the crisis of the Depression. What is the relationship between the citizens and the government? Um, do we owe anything to elderly people? Um, should you expect to live in poverty in your old age once you're like, you know, beyond your prime working years, maybe when you can't work anymore? Is that a problem that we as a society should be concerned about? If so, then what do we do about it? So you have something like Social Security, which is created, which creates a new relationship between the people and the government. 
and the people and each other too, because we're all paying taxes into the government, and it's a question of how that gets distributed. Um, we faced that again with Medicare in the 1960s, during the whole period of the Great Society and the War on Poverty. We faced the question, well, old people get really sick, and they cost a lot of money um, to take care of, and no private insurance company really wants to pay for the care of, you know, a highly costly, sick part of the population. So we said, okay, we'll create Medicare to take care of people over 65. Everybody else will get the health care through their employer or they'll buy their own. Except for poor people who they have a very hard time getting insurance too because, um, who knew, they're poor. So we're going to create Medicaid too um, to take care of that part of the population because, you know, we just noticed in the midst of this pandemic that um, whether people are healthy or not actually, whether the other guy is healthy or not actually has an effect on us. So, you know, this is part of <clears throat> this bigger question of how we relate to each other and what's fair. I've made this comparison uh, several times over the semester to the Civil War, which was a fundamental question in the mid-19th century about what the ground rules of society were. Who's a citizen? Can people own other people? Um, is being American premised on the idea of being white? And do black people have any rights at all? Um, in the Dred Scott case, prior to the Civil War, the Supreme Court said, basically, black people don't have any rights that a white man is bound to respect. Uh, 700,000 people later, um, we decided that that is not acceptable, and we changed the rule book. I've talked about the 1960s as being um, sort of a sequel to that struggle in the 1860s, that we were again fighting over what, what does the 14th Amendment mean? When we say people have equal protection under the law, what does that mean? After Plus C.V. Ferguson in 1896, we had the idea that, yeah, things can be separate, but as long as they're equal, it's fine. We all kind of knew that separate wasn't equal, but that's what people wanted, or at least that's what the white community, by and large, for the most part, not everybody, um, wanted to believe. By the time you get to Brown versus the Board of Education in uh, 1954, it's pretty clear and impossible to deny that separate is not equal. We talked about the long civil rights movement that was leading up to that, trying to chip away at the edifice of the doctrine of separate but equal. So that was the beginning. It wasn't the beginning. Like I said, it's a long process. But the 1950s and 1960s are a period where we see a renegotiation of the basic rules um, in terms of <clears throat> how people are treated by the government, who can vote how people are treated by businesses. Can you go to this restaurant? Can you sit at this lunch counter? Um, do you have to enter through a back entrance or sit in the mezzanine of a theater based on what your skin color is? Is that okay? And if not, then what do we do about it? So this comes back to that idea, the revolution of rising expectations. <clears throat> We've talked about this before. So these gains in the 1940s, 1950s, and into the 1960s created the perception that if we can make this much change, then maybe we can make a lot more change. Maybe if things can get a little bit better, maybe they can get a lot better. There's this opening of the imagination, this opening of the space of possibility in this time period. When people get a taste of freedom, they want more. And that's what you see happen. So you've got um, Dr. King, who was promoting one approach to changing the social contract, to changing the ground rules of society, to forcing a reckoning with these problems. And you could say, well, it was actually pretty um, successful. You had the Montgomery bus boycott. You had a series of civil rights victories in the Supreme Court. <clears throat> you had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which banned discrimination in public accommodations, at restaurants, movie theaters, etc. And you had the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was so important because it actually put teeth in federal enforcement of the right to vote, and especially throughout the former South, I mean the Southeast or the former Confederacy, where, um, as we've discussed before, 
uh, grandfather clauses, poll taxes, and so forth were used as means to basically make it so that African Americans could not vote without exactly saying that uh, we are denying the right to vote on the basis of race, which would have been unconstitutional. So the Voting Rights Act, it's a big deal. It's a huge victory. Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolent resistance seemed to be fairly successful. Now, a lot of people look at King and say, oh, you know, he's the touchy-feely, cuddly, lovey bear um, person. And Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and these other people, H. Rap Brown, are the, the radical, confrontational people. I don't know that's totally true. If you look at Letter for a Birmingham Jail, uh, King was certainly talking about confrontation. He wasn't talking about just asking nicely. He was saying, we are going to put the problem in your face. We'll go to jail. We'll get beaten up like John Lewis did and so many others. Uh, we'll risk our lives. We'll break the laws and we'll be punished. But we're going to heighten the tension until you have to, you know, make some change. You have to, the larger community has to acknowledge um, that there's a problem. And in, the, in this case, the larger community is... Um, by and large, um, you know, white middle America to say, hmm, yeah, we've always kind of known this is there, it's not good, like Jim Crow, segregation, blah, 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 inequality, ah, it sucks, I don't like it, but well, whatever. But King was saying, we're going to put it in your face. So it is confrontational. Remember King talked about in the letter from the Birmingham jail that we need to have creative tension. We cause a confrontation. We we do put it in your face in order to create this tension that is productive, <clears throat> that is creative, that leads to change and negotiation and dialogue and cooperation. You would say that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 seemed like pretty uh, substantial victories in that uh, direction. Remember, we saw the photos of um, a Philip Randolph and MLK and the Oval Office with LBJ. They were pu pushing the issue and actually getting pretty major systemic legal changes to civil rights. However, as we saw in the Pruitt Igo Myth documentary, um, you could have all the civil rights in the world. You could have all the formal, political, procedural rights on the books to be able to vote, to be able to serve on a jury, to be able to go to Target and shop at the same store as a white person. Um, but if you don't have any money, if you don't have a safe and decent place to live, if you don't have a job, if you're worried about being um, beaten to death by the police um, every day, then it seems like a theoretical, abstract kind of freedom. Are you really free if you are technically free, but you can't do anything? Uh, so you look at the Pruitt-Igo myth. These people are in this housing project, which is supposed to be helpful to the poor population, um, which in this case became largely African-American over, over time, not necessarily at the beginning, but you saw the decline of the housing project over the period from the late 50s into the early 70s. People look at this and say, well, I'm still living in shit, and my, I don't feel free. If I don't have the freedom to walk down the street, if I don't have the freedom to go into a store and actually buy something, then it's just hypothetical in a way. And this is where the frustration that led to the Black Power Movement came from, which is the, you know, maybe if this is if this is the most we can accomplish and things are still this bad, then something is wrong. And that means maybe we need to change the rules in a more thoroughgoing and intense way. So you get people like Malcolm X, who was always critical of King's approach. Um, he sort of saw Martin Luther King as the lovey, huggly, cuddly bear guy. Um, I don't think that's totally fair <laughs> because King did have pretty radical views about economics. Um, I think it's fair to say he was a socialist. He increasingly came out against the Vietnam War, which is an extremely unpopular position at the time that he was doing it. So King had a radical view of society. But Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, H. Rep. Brown, 
from the upper leaders were saying <clears throat> we need to stop being nice. Um, this isn't just about cooperation or um, negotiation. This is about demanding something. Now, I do think that the difference between you know, Malcolm X and King or the Black Panther Party and the older civil rights organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is to some extent rhetorical. It wasn't the open hand of, of love and peace that King was offering in the letter from the Birmingham jail. It was a clenched fist. Um, it was, we're not going to be nice. We're going to vote, but if we don't get anything or we get just a tiny little scrap from the master's table, then we'll go for the bullet. That's what Malcolm was talking about in the ballot, or the bullet. That was 1964. So think about that. That was before these victories, and then we see the victories, the legal victories, and things still are kind of shitty. So Stokely Carmichael, the folks who advocate the idea of black power, are saying, we're not going to try to make white people feel comfortable or, you know, sort of, love them into um, peace or cooperation or social justice, we're going to be in your face. We're going to be, we're going to use violent confrontational rhetoric. Now it's a bit of a historical misnomer, the idea that uh, the Black Panthers or the Brown Berets or these other, um, you know, um, social movements led by people of color in the 1960s that had militant rhetoric or militant goals there's, it's a misnomer to say that they were violent. For the most part, they were not violent at all. They used a very aggressive confrontational rhetoric. Um, as H. Rap Brown said, um, violence is as American as cherry pie. Um, wait, no, I think that was Carmichael. Anyway, uh, H. Rap Brown said, if Washington don't come around, burn it down. This was not a message designed to make um, you know, a middle-class uh, white man who owns a uh, uh, you know, motorcycle dealership in Peoria, Illinois, comfortable or, you know, down with the idea of civil rights. This was a way of saying, we are very angry and we want change. We want not just civil and political rights, we want social and economic rights. We want um, a guaranteed income. Uh, we want decent jobs. We want universal health care. We want all these things. Uh, we need. We want to change the actual structure of how the economy works, not just tinker around the edges with some, you know, little programs here and there, like, you know, the Great Society programs and the War on Poverty. We want a, a radical, revolutionary change in the way this whole thing is set up, and we're going to ask for it. But if we don't get it, then we're going to um, we're going to put the threat of more intense radical change behind our demands. Now, of course, you, as you can imagine, this um, did not make uh, middle America very comfortable, um, especially the people in the suburbs, the people in the suburbs outside of St. Louis that we saw in the pro Igo myth who said that, you know, we don't want um, black people living in our neighborhoods. We don't want poor people living in our neighborhoods. We don't want apartment buildings built here. We don't want public housing projects built here. Y'all keep that in there. We've got our nice little world out here. They, those people looking at the television saw that the cities from 1964 to 1968 in Harlem and Watts and Detroit and Newark were on fire, were burning down because people were so frustrated and so angry and so at their wits end that nothing is ever going to change, so why not just burn this whole thing down? And they saw this and they were like, well, what the hell? Like, we just gave you civil rights. Why aren't you happy? Um, so this is... This is part of this idea of the revolution of rising expectations, right? That like, how far can we push change? How, how much can we change the ground rules of society? If we can get this much, why can't we get a lot more? And then what is the outer boundary of that? So you see it with things like um, the Brown Berets. We often talk about the civil rights movement and sort of treat it as if the civil rights movement is the black freedom struggle. And that's like... They're, they are exactly the same thing. But I think it's fair to say that the civil rights movement encompassed a lot of different struggles. If you look at the Brown Berets, 10-point program that I asked you guys to look at, um, their demands are very similar to the Black Panthers' demands. Uh, what the 
Black Panthers and the Brown Berets did, by and large, was not um, carry out violent terrorism or political violence. Uh, they ran school lunch programs and health clinics for poor and impoverished neighborhoods. And what are the Brown Berets asking for, right? Take a look at, the, if you can pull it up on your computer, take a look at their demands, right? 10 points. That's two. This is 10. They want bilingual education. They want a civilian police review board so that they have some control in the Chicano community, the Mexican American communities of California and the rest of the Southwest, that part of the country that was taken from Mexico back in the middle 19th century. They want to have some oversight of who polices their communities um, so that they don't feel like they're being terrorized or threatened by um, police who are from another community who treat them with violence with impunity. Um, we want Mexican-American history to be taught in schools. Um, we want an end to urban, urban renewal programs that replace our barrios with high rent homes for middle class people. That sounds familiar, right? Gentrification is what we call it now. Back then it was called urban renewal. We demand a guaranteed annual income of $8,000 for all Mexican-American families. Interestingly, um, Andrew Yang, who ran for president in 2020, uh, was saying everyone should have a guaranteed minimum income. And in the midst of the pandemic crisis, you saw Republicans and Democrats saying that we should just send everybody money. So the idea of that the government should just provide people with a basic level of income um, is not new. And, you know, if Mitt Romney is saying it, then I don't know how radical it is. However, that was one of the demands of the Brown Berets. We demand that all Mexican Americans be tried by juries consisting of only Mexican Americans. A lot of people in our current society might look at that a bit askance. Uh, why should people only be judged by people of their own ethnic group or race? Um, but this is premised on the idea that there's this systemic ingrained violence of the system. And the only way we're going to change it is by having you know, much more profound control over our own communities, our own ghettos, barrios, whatever the case may be, um, and a thoroughgoing change in society. Okay, so I asked you guys to look at Juan Herrera's um, piece about the Chicano movement um, that is very interesting about women in the movement. Uh, that's actually part of a book that um, I was an editor of that was just published called East of East. And you can look at that article. I really want you guys to take a look at that because it shows how in the midst of this sort of radical socialist militant movement, um, women were often sidelined or treated in pretty degrading sexist ways. Um, a lot of women activists weren't willing to put up with that. But there was a, there was a long going tension in these movements between people who felt like women's issues are secondary. We have to look out for the interests of black people as a whole, or Chicanos as a whole, or Asian Americans as a whole. This issue of feminism is a distraction. It's not as important as the main thing. Uh, of course, a lot of women activists said, well, no, that's not fair. We're not going to just be in the kitchen uh, cooking you know, lunch and watching after the kids while you go around and play radical. Um, it's not just an, uh, a, a zero-sum game or a bin binary either-or. Uh, between um, the struggle of the race, of the people, the la raza, as Chicanos put it, um, and women, that these things were both important. That's a, a conflict that you see throughout this period. Finally, um, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to go into all of this, but um, certainly you see other groups in society, in American society, looking at what's happening with the black freedom struggle, with the Chicano movement, and saying, why shouldn't we have something, too? So you see the beginning of LGBT activism. Now, that's a bit misleading because there was LGBT activism prior to this. Um, there are several really good books that you can look at uh, if you're interested in this, such as Bohemian Los Angeles by Daniel Hurwitz. I'll put this in the show notes. Um, the Straight State by Margot Kennedy. So there had been people who had fought for LGBT rights prior to the 1960s. But um, the riot at, or rebellion, depending on how you look at it, at Stonewall, this bar in New York in 1968, is broadly 
you know, kind of viewed as a very important symbolic event where um, gay patrons of this bar who had been, you know, routinely harassed and terrorized by police um, for years. Like, everybody knew there was a, a, a gay underground nightlife in New York and other cities. Try to just ignore it and not think about it. The police could um, attack these people, harass, beat them, extort them because they were vulnerable and didn't have, you know, a, a lot of pull in society. For some reason, at a certain point, people decide that they're not going to take it anymore and they fight back. That sort of inaugurates an LGBT movement that we're going to see um, really develop, especially in the 70s and 80s. Um, first, demanding equal rights to, um, you know, uh, non-discrimination in the workplace, adoption, things like that. And then with the rise of HIV in the 1980s, uh, a lot of activism focused on finding a cure or treatment for the the disease, the plague. We're going to talk about that a lot. Native American groups who had been so um, uniquely brutally treated for ever um, also rose up and formed their own um, organizations and really put forth much more radical demands. Uh, looking at this and saying, hey, you know, if you can have black power, why don't we have our power? So you have the American Indian Movement. Um, which was founded in 1968. Uh, this is fighting poverty in Native American communities and the sort of gross uh, inequality and mistreatment um, from the federal government. Um, that actually leads to an armed standoff uh, with the federal government at Wounded Knee in South Dakota in 1973. These are movements that are looking at this and saying, yeah, we should do it too. Elderly Americans actually started organizing too. Um, and that's what you know people called gray power. So all these other movements are looking at it. Women as well, the feminist movement. We're gonna talk about this in greater detail when we look at Phyllis Schlafly in the 1970s. But women like Betty Friedan, Flora Steinem, were saying, it's awesome that we have suburban homes, capitalist prosperity, but we want more. That's not all there is. Um, and you know it's not unreasonable for us to ask for more. So that's what's happening in this time period. Remember, the idea of the revolution of rising expectations. We get a little bit, we want more. And then when we get frustrated, when we don't get what we think, that when we don't get that more, then we become even more radicalized. And that is what happens um, with a lot of these movements in this time period in the 1960s. The black freedom struggle, and then evolving into black power, black is beautiful, um, into the Chicano movement, the feminist movement, um, the gay rights movement, the American Indian movement, and so forth. A lot of different people seeing this opening in society and saying, I want more. Now, those demands come up against a lot of resistance, and a lot of politics since the 1960s in the United States has been about litigating and relitigating these uh, challenges to the way capitalism works, the way democracy works, the way the economy works, the way policing works, housing, um, what kind of rights people should have, what does equality mean? Uh, we talked about that with the gay wedding cake situation a few weeks ago. Those questions, you know, some of those questions like should people be able to vote seem very um, straightforward and uncomplicated, but the more you look at them, you see why people have been fighting over them for so long, because people have different ideas about what equality actually means and who deserves what, the social contract. So I'll leave you today with Langston Hughes back in the Harlem Renaissance, a poem called Harlem. And what did he say? What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? In the 1960s, we're going to see that the dream deferred does explode. And then we'll see what people's response to it is um, as we move forward. So thank you for listening. Um, we're going to have more of these. Please, you know, check out the readings for um, this assignment, Black, Brown, Yellow, Gray, Pink, Power. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the Vietnam War and America in the 1970s next. So be sure to read those um, pieces by Schlafly and watch the videos, Country Joe McDonald and so forth. Um, and we're going to talk about all these issues. So um, stay safe, look after yourselves, and um, use this opportunity of this situation that we find ourselves in to just reflect on um, the challenges we faced in the past and then what those questions of fairness and equality mean now. All right. Have a good one. Bye.